he just stood. And I was barely taller than he was. So, in fact, Otto is so tall that I don't even feel short anymore. I just feel like we're in different from, from different breeds. Um, so, just a word first about this collaboration we've had with Oncoclinicus, which has now gone on for almost a year, and in my view has been totally positive for us, and I hope positive for all of you. Um, our um, Roughly every other week, tumor boards seem to be going well, and we, we sit and we talk about cases back and forth. We've had several of you, and uh, I saw Rafael and Flavia here, um, and we've had several of you come up and spend some time with us, and, and that's been very positive. We've been down here. We've had a few patients come up and, and see us, and we've tried to make that as easy as possible. Um, and we're very anxious to keep this going and potentially to expand beyond breast cancer. Um, but that, of course, is a, a matter of, of ongoing discussion. But it's really been great for us. So I have the easy job tonight because Otto took on the job of reviewing a lot of data. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about just a couple of areas. And I'm going to go down in some depth into those areas. Um, and I think that they're, they're common clinical situations that we all wrestle with on a um, literally daily basis. So I'm mostly going to talk about adjuvant hormonal therapy in premenopausal women and appropriate treatment for women who have small HER2 positive cancers, which I'm going to define as stage one HER2 positive breast cancer. And I'm just going to end with about four or five slides on new agents that are either already here or potentially on the horizon, about which we've recently had some information. So hormonal therapy. It used to be so easy as a medical oncologist. Now, this, now I'm talking about 15 years ago, when you didn't have to worry if a woman were postmenopausal or premenopausal, and all you had to do was write a prescription for tamoxifen for five years. And we knew that across the board, the benefits of tamoxifen were apparent in women of all age groups. But the question now, not just in postmenopausal women, where we know we can do better by incorporating an aromatase inhibitor at some point along the way for most patients, but in premenopausal women, can we do better? So there are several potential approaches. Um, so first, of course, there's the 10 versus 5-year data with tamoxifen. This comes from both, from both the um, ATLAS study and from the ADAM study, both of which suggest that by giving tamoxifen for 10 years instead of 5 years, that you can further decrease the risk of recurrence. And in fact, in both studies, there was a small improvement in overall survival. I will tell you, I personally have some concerns about the studies. I have concerns about the way they were conducted because they were conducted in a fairly loose manner. There was no monitoring. There was no placebo. Um, however, it is hard to make up a difference in survival. So when you hear that there is a difference in survival, you have to take it relatively seriously. And I think for me, what this means is that in a patient who's premenopausal at diagnosis and is at relatively high risk of recurrence, that giving therapy for 10 years probably makes sense. I don't think this applies to the woman with stage 1 breast cancer or a woman who might even have a little more in the way of, of cancer but who has other uh, favorable prognostic factors because I do think you have to consider toxicity and the major toxicity both Adam and Atlas is the increased risk of uterine cancer by extending tamoxifen for 10 years. So what about ovarian suppression or ovarian ablation? Well, we've known for a long time that um, eliminating ovarian function, either by irradiating ovaries, which of course we don't do any longer, or removing ovaries, or more recently by giving LHRH agonists, is associated with a lower risk of disease recurrence if that's the only treatment you give. 
And so these are data from the overview, looking at all deaths, comparing women who um, received ovarian ablation versus those who did not. None of these women received chemotherapy. And you can see that there is clearly a benefit um, in terms of overall survival for women under the age of 50. And then there have been a number of studies in which people have looked back at women who went through menopause either temporarily or in a permanent way with chemotherapy, which have pretty strongly suggested that chemotherapy-induced menopause or chemotherapy-induced ovarian dysfunction also seems to augment the effectiveness of the treatment. Now, there are many questions about these studies, and, and these are associations rather than clear proof, but I think we have to take them seriously. And then, now, several years ago, came the results of the ABCSG12 trial. And I actually think the results of this trial were very impressive. So this is from our, our colleagues in Austria, and they took women um, who were premenopausal, who had lymph node negative or, or lymph node positive disease, although about two-thirds of these women had no negative cancers. Um, and they randomized them to receive either ovarian suppression plus anastrozole or ovarian suppression plus tamoxifen. And I think from this study, there are really two major take-home messages. One is that patients, regardless of which arm they were randomized to, did extraordinarily well with a five-year overall survival in the 93-94% range. The other message from this study, though, and I think you have to pay attention to this when you look at the soft and text data, um, is that if anything, women who received tamoxifen in, in, in ABCSG12 actually did a little bit better than women who received an aromatase inhibitor, specifically an astrozole. Now, it's hard to know exactly what to make of that, particularly in light of the more recent data I'm going to show you, but it certainly gives me um, a, a, a moment's pause. Um, and they have subsequently done an analysis that has looked at the impact of body mass index on the outcome in this study and have suggested that it may, in fact, be women um, who are overweight and obese and who do not have adequate suppression of estrogen levels um, with, with um, uh, an LHRH agonist who seem to get more benefit from tamoxifen than the aromatase inhibitor. Oops. So these are the designs of the text that soft studies text was presented at ASCO last year. Soft was presented at San Antonio this year. Both were discussed at St. Gallen. And in truth, at our tumor board on a weekly basis, we talk about these studies. We're perplexed about what to do. Um, and we really wrestle with these issues with patients on a daily basis. So if you do that, we do it as well. TEXT was a study in which all women received ovarian suppression with, with triptorolin, one of the LHRH agonists, and they were randomized to receive either tamoxifen or exemestane. SOFT asked in many ways what is the more important question and asked whether tamoxifen versus tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression versus exemestane plus ovarian suppression was the best um, overall treatment. So here is the result from text, and here in text, unlike what we saw in the ABCSG trial, exemestane was in fact the winner. But it was the winner from the standpoint of disease-free survival and breast cancer-specific survival, not from the standpoint of overall survival yet. And I think many of us looked at the ABCSG data and looked at these data and said, this is interesting but we don't know quite yet whether we should be routinely using exemestane or one of the other aromatase inhibitors in place of tamoxifen. But I do think that, that um, the study um, did um, make us that much more comfortable, even with tamoxifen, using ovarian suppression as, a, as an additional treatment. Um, I think the one thing you have to pay close attention to, though, 
um, from the text trial and then from the soft trial are side effects. And in the text trial, it was stated at the presentation and in the paper that there were a similar number of grade three and four events, um, that depression was seen in up to 50% of all patients, and the two arms probably largely related to a combination of having breast cancer and being abruptly put through menopause. But grade three or four depression was seen in a, in a very small minority of patients. Osteoporosis was more common with eczemestate, and the long-term implications of osteoporosis for a 40-year-old woman who's put on ovarian suppression and an aromatase inhibitor are uncertain. And then women on the eczemestane arm had more fractures, musculoskeletal symptoms, vaginal dryness, problems with libido, and pain on intercourse. Women who were on tamoxifen had more thromboembolic events, hot flashes, sweating, and urinary incontinence. And then just a couple of other uh, additional toxicities to pay attention to in terms of gynecologic cancers, um, somewhat more on the tamoxifen arm, although these are quite infrequent with five years of therapy. Um, and in terms of quality of life, overall changes in mood, physical well-being, and coping were reported to be similar. The eczemestane group had more detrim detrimental effects on um, bone, joint pain, vaginal dryness, as I, as I mentioned, and greater difficulties in terms of sexual functioning something that is often not talked about, but a problem that certainly a lot of our premenopausal women who go on these treatments face, sometimes they talk about it. I think they talk about it more with their, with their female oncologist than their male oncologist. Um, but it, it is, doesn't always show up in the quality of life studies, but it's still a major issue for a, a lot of women. Um, and then, um, for reasons that have never been clear to me, uh, the tamoxifen group had more in the way of hot flashes. But I think all of these side effects are side effects that we have to take very, very seriously. And my general sense is that if you um, put a patient on ovarian suppression and an aromatase inhibitor, that from at least an acute quality of life standpoint, you are doing far more harm than using tamoxifen. It is a abrupt decline in estrogen levels, and people feel it doesn't mean you shouldn't ever do it, but it means you have to think about it carefully. So then we have soft, and this is what came out in San Antonio this year. Um, and here is the overall result from soft. The primary analysis actually compared tamoxifen plus tamoxifen plus ovarian function suppression. And interestingly, this is a study that technically is a negative study. It did not meet its endpoint in terms of statistical significance, but nevertheless has had a huge impact on our practice, and I'll show you why. Um, and, and the secondary, secondary objective, I should mention, was looking at all three arms, and here, as was the case in text, the eczemestane arm seemed to do that much better. But really, the reason that soft has influenced our practice is that it is what I would call a tale of two populations. And those two populations, which are not necessarily entirely exclusive of one another, but are essentially the low-risk patients who didn't receive chemotherapy, and the high-risk patients um, who were both at higher risk of disease recurrence and received so these are the low-risk patients. Um, these patients were selected by their physicians not to receive chemotherapy. They were given endocrine therapy alone. Not all of them had no negative disease, but the majority of them did. There were 1,500 almost of these patients. And what you can see is there is essentially no difference in outcome. More importantly, if you look at distant recurrences, those numbers in the box are the absolute number of distant recurrences through five years on each of those arms. So on the, in the tamoxifen arm, six out of 476 patients had a distant recurrence. Seven, three, these are tiny numbers. And in my mind, there's little question that tamoxifen alone is the right treatment for these patients, given both 
the severe toxicities from a quality of life standpoint and the health effects of ovarian function suppression. But then we look at the other population, and this is the population of women who are at higher risk, who for whatever reasons, presumably because of their risk level, because they had a high grade tumor or more positive lymph nodes or some other feature, um, were given chemotherapy as well, and in spite of getting chemotherapy, were still premenopausal at the end of that chemotherapy and could be randomized on the trial. So this is also a somewhat younger patient population. And what you can see is that for this group of women who received chemotherapy, that tamoxifen seemed to perform the least well. There was a small improvement with tamoxifen and ovarian function suppression, and an even bigger improvement when exemestane was substituted for tamoxifen. And if you look at women under the age of 35, and there's a lot of overlap between women who received chemotherapy and women who were under the age of 35, so you can't take these as, as, as exclusive groups. In fact, I believe that over 90% of the women under 35 received chemotherapy and would have been in the previous figure as well. But you see this same impact with exemestane and ovarian suppression being the best treatment, tamoxifen and ovarian suppression second, and, and tamoxifen alone performing the least well, with, for what it's worth, an absolute difference of about 15%. So how do we interpret these trials, and what do you do in the clinic? And I, I have to tell you, I struggle with this. Um, so I would use tamoxifen alone for the patient who is at lower risk of disease recurrence, a woman with a small node negative cancer, or who has minimal node involvement, a woman who is an older premenopausal woman, woman, although from my standpoint, not, none of those women are old at this point. Um, a woman who you've chosen not to give chemotherapy to because you perceive her to be at lower risk, and maybe a woman who's at lower risk because of some genetic signature, but we don't know that yet, and those analyses are going to be done on the tissue blocks that were collected as part of SOFT. And in terms of ovarian suppression with either tamoxifen or an AI, I must tell you that in spite of the fact that the AI looked much better than tamoxifen, in that high-risk group of patients. I, I keep in mind the results of the ABCSG trial, and at least for me, it's still a hard decision to put somebody on an aromatase inhibitor as the initial therapy, and I still find myself with some frequency using tamoxifen and ovarian suppression, telling myself that depending on how the data evolve, we can always switch to an aromatase inhibitor after two to three years in the same way that we do in a postmenopausal woman. Um, and in general, I would use this approach in somewhat younger women, obviously women who are cycling after chemotherapy, and again, how the gene signatures play out, we don't know. Just a few additional um, points. None of these trials have yet to show a difference in overall survival. If, in fact, those differences that I showed you in women under 35 in disease-free survival hold up over time, you would expect they would translate into differences in overall survival. But remember that in postmenopausal women, the AIs are substantially better than tamoxifen in terms of disease-free survival. The difference in overall survival is minuscule. So we really need to see. Many patients will fall in a gray zone. I laid out two clearly distinct populations, but I can give you 10 patients. I could make up the cases, or I could just pull the cases from my own practice over the last month who fall in a gray zone. Toxicity is a major concern, particularly for some patients, and treatment decisions need to be individualized. And remember that if you put someone on a treatment that they don't take, it can't help them. So um, it's very important to pay attention to adherence issues. Um, and in the end, I suspect, but I don't know, that sequential therapy with tamoxifen followed by an AI in the setting of ovarian function suppression may be every bit as good, but we don't know that. So I want to move on and talk about another area, an area that is um, one that we have focused a lot on at, uh, at our center, and that's 
women with small HER2 positive tumors. And as you know, the remarkable results from the Edgman Trastuzumab studies presented in 2005 and published shortly thereafter were predominantly for women who had no positive breast cancer um, or patients who had T2 and larger tumors that were node negative. In fact, in the combined analysis of the NSABP and, and North Central studies, only 7% of the patients had node negative breast cancer. Um, so after that study, those studies appeared, there was a flurry of reports about the risk of recurrence for women who had small for 2 positive cancers, trying to shed some light on how we should manage those patients. Um, this is the most concerning series from, from that literature and looks at a group of patients from MD Anderson, about 100 patients with HER2 positive disease who did not receive chemotherapy. And of those exactly 98 patients, the five-year distant relapse free survival, so these are distant recurrences, was 85%. 15% of these patients with T1A or B lesions having a distant recurrence, which is certainly high enough to consider some form of therapy. But not all of the um, reports have been this concerning. So this, this actually comes from our group working in the NCCM database. So Inesh Vas-Louis, who a, 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 has been a fellow and now faculty member in our program, did this analysis in the NCCN looking at distant, free, distant relapse free survival, first in hormone receptor positive, HER2 positive disease. Um, and what you can see is that for patients with T1A tumors who did not receive chemotherapy or trastuzumab, 96% five-year uh, freedom from distant recurrence. T1B lesions slightly lower. Um, and this is a non-randomized comparison, so I think it's very hard to know what to make of um, of, of, of the difference between the two groups or the lack of difference, um, but maybe a suggestion of a bit of improvement for those patients who received chemotherapy or trastuzumab. Um, and these are for the patients with hormone receptor negative tumors. Um, if anything, maybe a slightly higher risk of disease recurrence, but it's, it's not so very striking. And then finally, this comes from the British Columbia Cancer Registry and looks at the risk of disease recurrence among women with stage 1 HER2 positive cancers. So this now includes not only T1A and B, but T1C lesions. And what you can see um, with the red arrow, which is fairly obvious, um, is that looking at women through 10 years of follow-up, that those who had HER2 positive and ER negative cancers had as high as a 25 or 30 percent chance of distant recurrence. And if I had to put estimates on, on the risk that a woman faces given all of these various studies, and this would be in the absence of any treatment, I would say that a woman with a T1A lesion that is HER2 positive has a 2 to 10 percent risk of disease recurrence, probably not as high as 10. That for a T1B lesion, 5 to 20, although I personally suspect that it's much closer to, to 10 or a little bit less than to 20, and somewhat higher for T1C lesions. And at least in 19, uh, excuse me, 2007, when we started the study that I'm about to describe you, the treatment of these patients was literally all over the map. Some patients were receiving chemotherapy alone, some patients were receiving a full course of chemotherapy, such as AC followed by paclitaxel plus trastuzumab. Some of these women were getting other trastuzumab-based regimens. And our goal was to try to uniform that treatment program and see if we could use a little chemotherapy with trastuzumab and do well. Um, so this is the study that, that we uh, proceeded with. And it was a study for patients who had HER2 positive tumors of three centimeters or less um, in the setting of node negativity. We treated 400 patients uniformly with 12 weeks of paclitaxel and a year of trastuzumab. Um, and I can tell you that the vast majority of these patients had stage one disease, 
only about 10% actually turned out to have T2 lesions. So the results I'm going to show you, I think, apply to stage 1 disease, but really don't apply for, to patients who have, who have larger tumors. Um, these are the patient characteristics. Um, as, I, uh, uh, as I mentioned, um, very few of the patients, actually 9%, had T2 lesions. Patients were roughly divided up equally in terms of having tumors less than a centimeter or greater than a centimeter. I think that is important because this was not a study that focused exclusively on women with tumors that were a centimeter or less. And these are the disease-free survival data that um, our colleague Sarah Tulaney presented in San Antonio a year and a half ago and then published in the New England Journal this year. Um, the um, three-year disease-free survival was 98.7%. And while three years is short, I'll remind you that all of the results from the um, adjuvant trastuzumab studies were initially presented with follow-up that was even shorter. Um, and if you look at the disease-free survival events, there were 10 such events. And of those events, two were distant recurrences. Three actually were contralateral cancers that were HER2 negative that you would never expect to be prevented with this regimen. And if you look at the recurrence-free survival, which censors the contralateral cancers and also censors the one death from ovarian cancer that we had to include in the disease-free survival analysis, um, the recurrence-free interval is 99.2%. So what are the implications of this? So I think that there are a few. First, paclitaxel and trastuzumab, I think, can be considered a reasonable approach if not the preferred approach, for the vast majority of women with stage 1 HER2-positive breast cancer. That said, not all patients require treatment. The risks are relatively low, particularly for patients with very small tumors. And most of us don't think that it is a standard to treat patients with T1A node negative lesions. We do so on occasion. The highly worried, motivated patient with a 4 millimeter ER negative HER2 positive cancer may get treated in our center, but certainly many others do not. Um, one of the standard and, and clearly more toxic classic regimens like TCH or ACTH can certainly be given if you have someone who you perceive to be at higher risk. The 29 year old woman who has a 2 centimeter ER negative high grade HER2 positive cancer with diffuse LVI, if you want to treat that patient with, with one of the so-called more established regimens, I think that's entirely reasonable. Um, and while an all-biologic regimen, a regimen like trastuzumab and pertuzumab alone, might actually turn out to be entirely reasonable in this setting, we don't know. But as long as you're going to give some chemotherapy, I think these data suggest that in this patient population, no matter what happens with the affinity trial, you sure don't need to add on a drug like pertuzumab. Um, at St. Gallen, um, the panelists voted that the TH regimen was the preferred regimen for all women with tumors a centimeter and less. There was a mixed vote for patients who had T1C tumors, but a sizable minority also endorsed TH. And as I mentioned, at our institution, we consider this to be the standard regimen for stage one. Whoops, I did something. Stage 1 disease. So here's how I look at it. Now, you have to take this with a grain of salt. And you also have to remember that I hate TCH um, because I think it's a terribly toxic regimen. So um, if you, um, what was I saying with that first bullet? So I'm not sure what I'm trying to say with that first bullet. But TCH is clearly one of the standard regimens. Um, so let's, let's just sort of start with TCH. Well, in my mind, TCH is probably the same as getting TH, Taxotere and Herceptin. That's been shown in the neoadjuvant setting, and it's been shown in the metastatic setting. I think carboplatin is an inert drug in patients with HER2-positive breast cancer. Now, TH, Taxotere Herceptin, is almost certainly identical to Taxol Herceptin. And so if you follow this logic, then 
let's say for a minute that TCH is a little bit worse than ACTH. Um, the truth is, TH is probably also a little worse than ACTH because you're not giving the AC, but it just doesn't matter in the vast majority of patients with small tumors. Um, and for that matter, this is also probably a regimen. We don't know this. I don't do this routinely. This is also probably an entirely reasonable regimen in the 68-year-old woman who has far more disease but who has comorbidity and who shouldn't be receiving anthracycline. And at least at our center, we give less and less TCH, um, which I think is a regimen that you should give when you want to avoid the anthracycline. And we do tend to give more TH. But again, that's just my way of thinking about it. Um, this is our ongoing trial, which is called the ATTEMPT trial. Um, it compares TH for 12 weeks, um, followed by a year of Perceptin versus TDM1 um, for an entire year. This is not trying to improve on the, our previous results from an efficacy standpoint. We don't feel we can improve on them. It's trying to give a similarly efficacious regimen with less toxicity so a woman doesn't have to experience alopecia and the other toxicities associated um, with a taxane. And at the moment, um, we have about 175 patients enrolled out of a total of 50, uh, 550 that will, that will ultimately be enrolled. And this is not a classic phase three study. It's a randomized phase two. We, our statistical design for the TDM1 arm is very similar to our design in the TH study. And we included TH to have a comparison, a direct comparison of toxicity. I'm going to skip past these two and give you three quick updates in the end. So first, Cleopatra. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but I just can't not emphasize it. So Cleopatra, as you know, is the study that randomized first-line patients, first-line in the metastatic setting, patients with HER2-positive disease, to docetaxel, trastuzumab, placebo, placebo or docetaxel, trastuzumab, pertuzumab. The study showed a progression-free survival difference of six months in spite of the fact that patients came off pertuzumab when their disease progressed. Um, and in spite of the fact that that difference was only six months, there is a 15-month improvement in overall survival in this study. And in my mind, what that is saying is that somehow early treatment with pertuzumab changes the natural history of the disease it alters the biology, it alters subsequent resistance mechanisms, and this is just a very interesting finding and also potentially one that's very important for patients. Second, TDM1, great drug. I don't think you have it in Brazil yet, do you? You do, you now have it. TDM1 is a great drug. It has very limited toxicity for those of you, those of you who have used it know that now. Um, unfortunately, though, it's not likely to be better than um, a taxane, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab. And the way we know that is from the Marianne results. We're going to hear these results at ASCO in about 10 days. The only thing we know is from a press release. But what that press release said was that comparing trastuzumab docetaxel, no pertuzumab, with TDM1 or TDM1 pertuzumab, that there was actually no evidence of superiority for TDM1 or TDM1 pertuzumab, and that's comparing it to an inferior control arm now. Um, they, they, um, they were non-inferior, and they could turn out to be a little bit better than docetaxel trastuzumab, but again, um, makes it very unlikely that a TDM1 containing arm is going to be better than docetaxel, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab. What about neratinib? Neratinib has been hanging around for a long time. Neratinib is, in my mind, a better lapatinib. Um, it's good that something's better than lapatinib because lapatinib isn't a great drug. Um, but neratinib is an irreversible inhibitor of HER1, HER2, and HER4. It also has more toxicity than lapatinib. Um, in, two, in, um, in phase two trials done several years ago, 
clearly had activity in both patients who had never received trastuzumab and in those patients who had received trastuzumab, 24% objective response rate in patients with prior trastuzumab, 56% objective response as a single agent in patients who had never received uh, trastuzumab. But it's been looking for a home. It was compared to keep cytidine and lapatinib and wasn't better um, and has simply not managed to, to be in a study where it could be approved. And this is yet another press release. This one came out about eight months ago, and we're finally going to have data at uh, ASCO. This comes from a randomized trial in which patients who received adjuvant chemotherapy plus trastuzumab were randomized at the end of their adjuvant therapy with trastuzumab to get a year of neratinib or a year um, of placebo. Um, and in fact, what they are saying in the press release is that there is a small advantage um, for neratinib over placebo. Whether this will be a big enough advantage to lead to an approval, I don't know. And I think the other two big questions are, is the toxicity manageable and something patients will accept? And second, what does it mean if affinity is a positive trial? This was done pre-affinity, and if we increase the relapse-free survival rate that much further by adding pertuzumab, does it matter to use an agent like neratinib? So we'll see. Um, and finally, ASCO is less than two weeks away, and all of these data will, will come out there. Thanks very much. Appreciate the attention.